Welcome to Second Saturday Conversation, where we explore Christianity in and for the 21st century. Christianity in the 21st century is, is all over the place. Um, there never has been just one Christianity, and uh, certainly today there is not just one Christianity. We're still interested in discovering or rediscovering the heart of Christianity. What brings out the best in us? But not everyone is interested in Christianity anymore. Some say that uh, we are seeing the end of Christendom. Some say we're seeing the end of church. Um, and then there are some who bemoan the secularization of society or, or that's how they perceive it. So Christianity in the 21st century is problematic and puzzling. Christianity for the 21st century. Well, what if anything does Christianity have to offer an uncertain future? Well, it remains to be seen. And I've not given up on it. Um, Christianity is not the only way, but I think that it is one of the great historical religious traditions. Our overall theme this year is skylight and seasoned tongue and groove. And that is an image from a poem by Seamus Haney called The Skylight. And we'll post that uh, as one of our closing slides. A skylight is an opening in a closed and um, trunk lid fit ceiling, as Seamus Haney puts it. A skylight lets light in, it reveals a landscape or a horizon, it lets us imagine possibilities beyond the familiar. I kind of like to think that that's what we do here on Second Saturday. And I love how Emily Dickinson puts it. She, she says in an untitled poem, I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky. And, and gambrels are uh, sort of a symmetrical two-sided roof um, on a building. So for an everlasting roof, gambrels of the sky. So skylight, dwelling in possibility, possibility. I'd like to think that's what Christianity is about. Jeff Creswell, my friend and colleague, would you like to orient us a little bit to um, the the upcoming plenary time and how to raise your hand and all of that kind of stuff? Sure. Good morning, Marianne. Good morning, good Jeff. And good morning, everyone, and welcome to Second Saturday. Um, as Marianne has suggested after the um, her sharing and reflections, there will be a plenary time where you will have an opportunity to interact with Marianne and with the larger conversation. And um, the way that we have been um, doing that is that if you go down to the bottom of the menu bar in your Zoom, you'll see um, a thing that says um, reactions. And down there is an opportunity to raise your hand. It'll put a little hand on your screen and that will pop you to the front of the queue of people that are um, displayed. And um, I'll be calling on people with hands raised. One of the things you should know about that is that the, um, the order in which those people show up may be different from screen to screen. So uh, it may look to you like you're the next one in the queue, but if you're not the next one called on, that's because what I'm seeing is a little different. And um, we'll certainly get to as many people as we can. And if we're not able to get to you during the regular time, there is an opportunity to interact with Marianne in a more less less formal way uh, during our coffee time, which will immediately follow the, the session. Um, one other thing I'll say is 
it's very helpful if you do raise your hand and would like to share a reflection or a question that you compose what it is you'd like to say before raising your hand. Um, some of us are people who think out loud. And if you do your thinking in your head first and then raise your hand, that will keep what you have to say succinct and offer the opportunity for other people to be able to contribute. And so if you can keep your comments to uh, two minutes, that would be helpful. And um, if you tend to be going over two minutes, I'll just simply put up a little finger like this, which is a gentle reminder that it's time to close what you're saying so that Marianne can have an opportunity to respond and we can give other people an opportunity. So thanks, Marianne. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And I know that some of us um, think, as you said, out loud. <laughs> so to, we'll, we'll do our best to have some kind of hospitality of conversation and be mindful of the time and giving other people an opportunity as well. So anyway, thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, today, I want to uh, begin a conversation about uh, poetics. And I don't mean poetry in particular, although poetry can be part of poetics, but poetics is a, it's a kind of uh, language. It's, it's, it's also, it's a kind of writing, but I want to explore this and, I, and I'll do, I'll do more exploring of, of uh, poetics um, and dogmatics next time as well. But the word poetics comes from uh, a word poesis and that's P-O-I-E-S-I-S, -I -I poesis. And that means to make or to create or to bring something forth that hasn't been before. So poesis is to make something possible that we didn't think was possible before it happened. <laughs> so in many ways, poetics or poesis, it's, um, it's a kind of event. It's, it's an experience. And it evokes in us, and I think it's prompted also by imagination. And poesis or poetics, it's a creative expression. And um, to say something about imagination, imagination has often been sort of discounted. Um, but, you know, philosophers and others have discussed the importance of imagination forever and ever. And there's a suggestion, and I actually agree with this, that imagination precedes and exceeds reason. That imagination precedes factual information. It precedes dogmatics. OK, um, dogmatics are always a derivative of um, some something that has stirred us and that we wonder about. OK, so you can't in poetics and in poesis, you can't escape imagination. And, and that's a good thing. I'd also like to say that poetics or poesis is a is a is a is a way of paying attention. It makes us more attentive it in in that it makes us more alive attentiveness makes us more alive before we die and i think that poesis or poetics is really at the heart of um human the human enterprise it's kind of the love dub of our of our being okay so Dogma tends to propose or impose solutions and answers. It claims that this is the right position. So it's and that it's already that it's determined. And therefore it's kind of determined. Poesis tends more to hold space open. It, uh, it lets you see more, wonder more. I would say poesis or poetics is inseparable from possibility, okay? It's, it's more open-ended. Dogma and dogmatics tends to be more closed. 
Okay, that's part of its task is to try to close things, um, make things more definite, um, uh, make a play for certainty. And poetics does almost the opposite of that. So poetics helps us to construct meaning. Our response to something poetic is then we it it, it prompts us to to for us to construct meaning rather than telling us what something means or what it's about. So it's more of an invitation than it is even a proclamation. And so needless to say, a poetic response or poesis, that process of making and creating something that we hadn't anticipated before, poetic, poetics can have multiple uh, meanings, multiple expressions. It's diverse. And this is poetics democracy. So, as I said, poetics communicate somewhere deep within us before it's intellectually or even emotionally understood by us. Okay. And poetics, as I said, is not just about poetry. I mean, you can experience poetics in literature, but, but also in, in, in the arts and in music and in painting and um, in science. I think the, the inspiration of science comes from imagination. And of course, we see poetics in religion. We also see dogmatics in religion. We see dogmatics and poetics, okay? And I think that poetics and dogmatics shape history. So poetics, as I said, is a kind of language, it's a kind of felt language. So because of that, and, and we, we can sense it with our senses, okay? So poetics is more embodied than dogma. It's, it, it appeals more to the senses. It's more of an experience. It's, I would, I would say it is more persuasive than an argument. Because it appeals to us in a different sense. It's, it, we have an experience when we have, when we encounter poetics. And, and, uh, and poetics and the imagery and uh, imagination of poetics is more powerful than abstraction. Again, we, we feel it. it. There's something about poetics where we would say, I resonate with that. And um, some uh, have said that resonance is more important than relevance. And certainly that would be true in poetics, that resonance is more important than relevance. We can argue that. So, um, yeah, let me also just make one little sidebar comment. Um, Paul Ricoeur uh, has done a lot of um, thinking about symbol and language and expression. And he insists that experience gives rise to a symbol or to an expression or uh, to a poesis. Experience gives rise to symbol. And then symbol gives rise to thought in that order. And I think that we tend to think about thought <laughs> As, as almost detached from an initial experience. We put a lot of emphasis on thought, and, and I do too. But I like Ricoeur's schema that experience gives rise to symbol and language and arts and all of that. And then from that, we have thought, reflection. From that, we ponder meaning. Anyway, just that's just a, a little aside. Okay. Um, in talking about poetics, and here I've been talking about it, I, I want to um, uh, give you a, an example of what I think poetics or poesis is. And, and I, and I want to draw from 
an experience that we had with Belden Lane at our last session. Now, maybe not all of you were there, but Belden Lane, um, he's a he's a retired uh, Presbyterian pastor. Uh, he's a professor. He's an author. He has a beautiful hand. Um, he's a lover of souls and all things uh, creation. Um, he, I would, I dare say, he knows the souls language. He is also a nature mystic, and by that I mean he communicates with nature, and nature communicates with him somewhere deep within him. And I think that he resonates with something deep in the natural world. So what I want to recount is an experience that Belden talked about in his talk with us, okay? And I, I actually happen to um, be present at the very experience he describes, but I, I want to recall that for us because I think that what Belden described had a, if you will, a poetic effect on us. I think it was poesis at work. Okay, so let me just uh, refresh our memories about this particular incident that I want to recount. Um, this was at Ring Lake Ranch, which is in um, outside of Du Bois, Wyoming, which is about 90 miles uh, east of Jackson Hole. So uh, it, it was an experience at, at Ring Lake Ranch. And at that particular session at Ring Lake, Belden was the presenter. But one of, I mean, we, we talked a lot about grief. We talked about a, a lot about loss. There were a lot of people who had experienced grief and loss. Um, we also talked about the, the wonders of the natural world and um, sort of its, its risks and wonders. And, and um, we sort of, um, it was an unplanned part of the, the gathering but we we ended up deciding, and and um, uh, Belden was at the head of this, but so were some participants in the in the in the program, who said let's sort of have a ritual, to express, maybe though in a nonverbal way, some of the things we've been experiencing and feeling at, at this session. So we went down to Trail Lake, and. Um, we we gathered at the edge of of um, uh, the land there and looked out over Trail Lake and and it was decided that you know people would take a stone and and embody it with some of their uh, an experience whether it was something they wanted to release or something that they wanted to offer uh, into uh, uh, you know the the lake into the river of life into the chaos and let it reverberate but. So however people wanted to give meaning to the stone that they would select and then throw into the river, into the lake, excuse me, was up to them. But it was to hold and express part of what we had been experiencing around our griefs and loss. And interestingly enough, there was a man who was part of the session who's a First Nation person, and he offered a, a, a prayer, a song prayer, um, in his native language. And so he sort of, if you will, evoked the spirit in this, in his in, in native language that was probably much more familiar to the land than it was to us. And so people in silence then went forward and threw their stones. And when Belden came to the lake to, to, to throw in his stone, he 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 just it just expressed himself aloud. And, uh, oh, let me also say his son, John, had died a couple of years before. Okay? It was unexpected and shocking. And um, he had, um, hello, little Theo. Um, he had died a couple of years before, and this was a, a sort of an excruciating, um, of course, excruciating um, experience for Belden. So when Belden threw the rock into the lake, he, he then he cried out, John, I love you, John. I love you. He and John had been at Ring Lake Ranch together, incidentally. So John also knew that terrain. He knew that lake. They had shared experience in that wilderness together. But he just, he cried out, oh, John, John, I love you. And, and it just sort of shattered the silence uh, in, a, in, a, in a powerful and good way. And... Um, after he did said that, 
So all of a sudden, two osprey showed up in the sky and two osprey started to, I mean, it was almost like they danced together and two osprey sort of came around us and then a third one joined them and we were just uh, silenced by this graceful presence of these three birds and we were sort of transfixed and and we were really all of us were moved I mean it was like lake and birds and the cry and sky and land were all participating in something that really touched us and we we were all transformed by that in some way and we we recognized the sacredness of that moment and i will call it sacred i mean we don't cognize the sacred we recognize it and we all recognize the sacredness of this whole experience and moment and something resonated deeply within us we we felt something and we shared it in in our feeling nonverbal way something addressed us at a deep level in our human life and in our fragile world. So Belden shared his experience with us about his son. We shared together this moment at the lake. We, and then the Osprey came and ended up participating in something that was really beyond us, but also something that we felt deeply in us. And whatever all of that constellation was, it was so real. I mean, it was palpable, whatever that was. And it, I mean, logic has nothing to do with this. It suspends logic. This whole thing created an experience for us. And as I said, we responded. And it is nothing that we actually planned or expected in our session, but then it happened. And it was really not of our, totally of our creating. Something else created, was created in this moment. I think that's the power of poesis. And we didn't have to try to explain anything about what we experienced. We just experienced what we experienced. But it, as I said, it was palpable. And I think that is what I'm trying to describe when I talk about what is poesis, what is poetics. What Belden shared with us, I think, is an expression of poetics and poesis. And... Um, I mean, literature can do that for us. Music can do that for us. The inspiration of science can, can do that. Um, so this experience that Belden talked about in our last session, I think, I hope illustrates for you a little bit about what I'm getting at with poesis. And let me also say that theology, you know, it, it doesn't always need theological language to express itself. And I see Theo's little ball back here. Hold on. Theo, here's your ball. Um, obviously, Theo wants to be part of this too. He must feel that there's something going on and there is. So um, that's, uh, that's something about poesis and poetics. Um, so let me, um, Jeff, you and I, uh, talked yesterday at, about this kind of stuff and you shared a poem with me that and in this case um it is a poem okay and I, i'm uh, jeff i'm going to ask you to share that poem with us okay um so what i'd like jeff to do is share this poem and in this case it is a poem 
But I think that within the poem, it the poem itself is poesis. We experience something in the way that, that this poem describes um, the swan, that we actually end up experiencing what the poet, what the poem is describing. Yeah. The experience of the poem then becomes our experience. Okay. And uh, and I think that's poesis. Okay. So um, to, to, as another illustration, uh, Jeff, do, would would you share that poem and sort of your reflections on that? I, I, I'd be happy to, Marianne. I, as you were describing that experience you had with Belden at the lake, it, it reminded me of Thomas um, Thomas Merton talking about a hidden wholeness, mm -hmm. and it, what it you were connected to that hidden wholeness in that moment, and it was beyond words, mm -hmm. but it was a deep knowing, and mm -hmm. I think this poem addresses that as well. The poem, the poem is called. Who would have known, by the way? Who would have known that there was this this uh, this hidden wholeness? Yes. In an in an in a time when we were all experiencing our griefs and loss, loss, and how much we was unanswerable about why these deaths happened, and yeah. uh, how much we can't explain about our own sense of grief and loss. Okay, mm -hmm. so who? I mean, I appreciate what you just said because who would have? We would not have immediately assumed that there that there's a hidden wholeness in this. If somebody had said that to us, or if somebody had said to me shortly after Marcus died, there's a hidden wholeness in this. It's like, don't tell me. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I have, I've experienced that, but that's the difference between somebody saying, let me tell you what right. this is versus I need, I need to know for myself. I need to experience this. Yes. It, whatever's going on is so deep that those kind of words, it isn't going to, it doesn't touch me where I need to be touched. Mm. That makes sense. You yeah. Know? So, and I think that that's the power of poesis. So, okay, now back to you. And the, the, the poem is called The Swan. It's by Mary Oliver. And I think Mary Oliver has a gift of um, giving us language that helps us to connect with that hidden wholeness, as you said, Marianne. The Swan. Did you too see it? Drifting all night on the black river? Did you see it in the morning, rising into the silvery air? An armful of white blossoms, a perfect commotion of silk and linen as it leaned into the bondage of its wings. A snowbank, a bank of lilies, biting the air with its black beak. Did you hear it fluting and whistling? A shrill, dark music, like the rain pelting the trees, like a waterfall knifing down the black ledges. And did you see it, finally, just under the clouds, a white cross streaming across the sky, its feet like black leaves, its wings like the stretching light of the river. And did you feel it in your heart, how it pertained to everything? And have you too finally figured out what beauty is for? And have you changed your life? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll copy that and put it in the chat, Marianne, for people. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Great. That's an example of the poetic power of poesis. And I love where that poem leads us, takes us, um, wondering about, yes, beauty, but also, in light of the experience of this one, have you changed your life? I mean, can the experience of really experiencing a swan change your life? Uh, 
I would say yes. So to um, uh, shift the angle a little bit about language, um, words, whether they're poetic or dogmatic, can shift our perceptions, can transform us. They can transform a sense of who we are. And words, whether they be poetic or dogmatic, can um, shift how we understand. So language can bring out the best in us or the worst or expose the best in us or the worst <laughs> in us. I mean, language is very... And I want to... Um, say a couple of cautionary, make a couple of cautionary comments about language. Um, and I'm gonna draw from um, Ruth ben Giat. I'll say more about her in just a second. But um, what I, for us folks here on Second Saturday, I, I don't want us to fall asleep at the wheel. <laughs> or as, as um, Annie Dillard says, we sleep to times hurdy-gurdy. We awake if we awake. Well, I think those of us here on Second Saturday are um, intent on staying awake. So um, I'm gonna draw uh, briefly from a blog by Ruth ben Giat. Her blog is called Lucid. Um, she wrote this um, on the 28th of February. So this is a fairly recent blog. Uh, she is a professor of history and Italian studies at New York University. Um, she's an American historian and critic, cultural critic. And she is a scholar of fascism and authoritarian leaders and characteristics of authoritarian leaders. The blog entry is from a talk that she gave um, in mid-February and listen to the title of the talk. The title of the talk is What Happens to Language When Authoritarianism Takes Hold? What happens to language when authoritarianism takes hold? And here's her subtitle. Resist the perversion of language and the destruction of meaning. Resist the perversion of language and the destruction of meaning. I would say that is a call to us. She says, as, as, as I did just a moment ago, that language can change the way people think and feel and can change the associations we make when we hear certain words. Then she goes on to speak about the persuasiveness of propaganda and how, how language can be, um, uh, as she says, turned upside down. And here she gives some examples, like when, she says, the rule of law gives way to rule by the lawless, or those who take away our rights pose as protectors of freedom or those people who stormed the Capitol are patriots. Or, and she quotes Tucker Carlson in an interview he had with Putin, uh, in justifying actually Putin's assassination of Navalny, Tucker Carlson said, well, leadership means killing people. He actually said that. This, as Ruth ben Kiat says, is language turned upside down. This is the perversion of language. That it really means this, not this. <clears throat> she says that the most, and this, and now I quote her, that the most value, uh, valuable responses 
to tragedies and oppression come from the creative realms of art, performance, and poetry. She goes on, the evocative power of poetry has a unique function of redeeming language in situations where language is being abused and also stripped of meaning. She's an historian. She's a scholar. She's a cultural critic. She says that it is the creative realms of art, performance, poetry, that are the most valuable responses to tragedies and oppression. She quotes a linguist, and actually I love this little quote. Words can be like tiny drops of arsenic. Swallowed unnoticed, appear to have no effect. And then after a little time, the toxic reaction sets in after. Words can be like tiny drops of arsenic. She concludes, as authoritarianism advances in America, and I think that a nonpartisan observation is that it is, or trying to, as authoritarianism advances in America, we will look to poets to uphold the beauty and precision of words and the healing power of language. The healing power of language. I think poesis has that capacity. Dogmatism may want to have the same effect, but its effect is really otherwise. So <clears throat> I, I know that we are all aware of the power of language to liberate and to entomb to heal, and also how language can be weaponized. So I say to you all, stay awake. <clears throat> One more um, uh, reflection on my part about language, again, in a, from a slightly different uh, angle. Um, briefly, I want to say something about Jesus and Lent. In the Christian liturgical year, we are in the season of Lent. And actually, before we meet next time, we will, we will have had Easter. Easter is early this year. It's March 31st. <laughs> so <clears throat> I would say, and this is not uh, unique uh, to me, others have made this comment uh, in many ways, that Jesus was a poet that Jesus was a verbal artist and that Jesus' uh, poetry, his teachings were more like poetry. They were parables and stories and he uses imagery and, and, and actually his teachings kind of resist closure. You know, um, his teaching, Jesus sort of defied succinct dogma. Um, Jesus and his teachings, I think, were more like an event where we ask, what's happening in this? What just happened in what he shared? What just, um, what did we just experience? In the season of Lent, we, the, the narrative is that we journey with Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, and traditionally, it's uh, been a time of penitence. That's kind of the emphasis uh, these days um, where we uh, uh, spend time thinking about our sinfulness and our shortcomings, okay? Um, 
But before that emphasis, Lent actually, the real focus of Lent in the earlier centuries was on mortality. Um, on all of our mortalities. I mean, Jesus died. We will die, okay? The reality of mortality. And, and by the way, please don't think that mortality is the price of sin. So as we know, the, the Lenten journey ends with Jesus' execution. And Jesus was killed by the domination system of his day, in large part because Jesus embodied and spoke to in a poetic way, in the, with the power of poesis, a counter narrative to the narrative that the domination system said was the way things are, the way things need to be, the way things are supposed to be. And Jesus was a counter narrative in body and in thought and teaching to that presumption that the domination system, that that was the way that things need to be, to be best and to function best. Jesus, as a counter narrative, said something else quite, quite different than that is possible. And he lived that. He showed and embodied, this does not have to be this way. Something else is possible. And his followers experienced that other possibility. They experienced it in him. They experienced it in the way that he said, we can live and be with one another. Um, it, was, it was another way of being. I suggest that Lent is more a season knowing the reality of our mortality, that this is a season to take life seriously <laughs> and to consider and recognize that life is a gift, that, the, that, that life is the gift of our being, that we get to be, and that our gift in return is our becoming, which is an ongoing part of life, to become, to um, reflect again and again on how we live and love and hope and make possible what otherwise would not have been and our gift to life includes making things possible so that the future can be better. Even a future that will not be ours. So for me, the Lenten journey with Jesus has, has nothing to do with Jesus dying for our sins. So that um, we can, that Jesus somehow will uh, make us right with God and then give us entry into heaven. I, I say this, this isn't, that's not why we follow Jesus. Following Jesus is not some quid pro quo. It's not about some transaction. We follow him and we learn from him because he had a vision, a dream, a conviction. Uh, I might even say an intuition about us and how we can live our lives with one another and love one another. And about things that are possible that we might not even yet imagine are possible. And that dream that kind of knowing that there is something more drove his passion to where he risked everything for it. So I suggest that we follow him because we see that dream too. 
that dream that we can do all of this a different way resonates with us. That we know that it's possible, even if it seems impossible. So they may have killed the poet, but they could not kill the dream. And the poem, the, the dream, the poem will not die as long as we continue to live it and make it happen and continue to imagine and reimagine again and again. And I suggest, for my thinking is these days, is that for me, that is resurrection. That resurrection is possibility. It isn't about resuscitation. <laughs> it isn't about a corpse. It isn't even about the, the retrieval of the past as the past, but more a forward repetition of the dream. Resurrection, I suggest, is about possibility. And I caution that we not reify it or we may miss the meaning. Okay. I'm really curious to know what is um, uh, uh, churning in your own thoughts. Um, I'd love to get your uh, reactions to uh, sort of my, uh, what I've been pondering today. Okay. I mean, I've talked about poesis and the power of poetic language. I've also talked about the capacity of language to deceive and destroy. And, and also, I am using the language of the Lenten uh, season a little differently. I mean, I'm using different language to describe what I think the Lenten season is about. So I would love to hear from you what's coming up in your mind, what kind of prompts my thinking is for you, uh, what your thoughts are about all of this. And um, let me um, uh, take the time to uh, read the discernment listening guidelines. And that may also give you, even though I'd like you to pay attention to the guidelines, uh, most of you are familiar with them, but also give this will give you a chance to maybe think about what you'd like to share. So um, a reminder about this, the listening guidelines, and this is part of our hospitality, okay? By the way, dogmatism doesn't have much linguistic hospitality. Poesis has a lot of linguistic hospitality. Um, so here, here are our guidelines for, for our conversation. To take time to become settled in God's presence. Listen to others with your entire self, with feelings, senses, feelings, intuition, imagination, and rational faculties. That's kind of a poetic way of listening, don't you think? Do not interrupt. Pause between speakers to absorb what's been said. Okay. Um, in other words, don't, don't, don't overly rush on somebody else's comments. Don't formulate what you want to say while someone else is speaking. Okay, that's like talking over them in your own mind. Okay. Speak for yourself only, expressing your own thoughts and feelings, refer to your own experience and avoid being hypothetical and steer away from broad generalizations. That is not easy to do. I think many of us are more sometimes comfortable with being sort of hypothetical or talking about broad generalizations. I think it's harder sometimes to talk about our own experience. And that's an interesting one to think about is it because we don't value it, because we don't think it's as important, What? but our guidelines encourage you to express your own experience. Don't challenge what others say. That's also not an easy one. Listen to the group as a whole, to those who've not spoken aloud, as well as to those who have. Even on Zoom, I'm experiencing that we have, we, we get a feel for the group here on Second Saturday, even though we're Zoom, we're Zooming. Um, 
generally leave space for anyone who may want to speak a first time before speaking a second time yourself. And this one isn't easy either. Hold your desires and opinions, even your convictions, lightly. <laughs> so um, we we do our best to um, to abide by these guidelines. So let me just give you um, 30 seconds uh, before we move into plenary to see what comes up in your own thoughts um, and what you would like to share in light of my conversation today about poetics and dogmatics. And I suggest that what the world needs now is poetics, not dogmatics. So let me give you just 30 seconds in the silence and then we will begin our conversations. Okay, Jeff, do you want to help facilitate this for us? Sure, sure. Lots to think about, Marianne. My head is spinning. <laughs> and that's kind of my intention. You know, it's like, just give us stuff to think about. And and uh, I, I want it to provoke more thought for us. I'd like to think that my thoughts provoke your thoughts and your thoughts will provoke more thoughts and that'll provoke more conversation. That's kind of what I'm interested in. Yeah. And see where that'll take us. Yeah. Well, there's some, some interesting comments coming up in the chat. I think people are, people are, have, have lots of ideas. So it'll be nice to hear from folks. And Let's... I'm just sorry that I don't see the chat, but that would be a, a huge distraction for me, even though the chat is valuable for, uh, and is, and is an important part of our conversation. Yes, yes, it surely is. And just a, just a reminder, I'll call on people to unmute themselves who have their hands raised. And um, when you speak, try to limit your comments to two minutes. If, um, if you start to go over that time, I'll just put up a finger like this as a gentle reminder that it's time to wrap up. So there can be uh, some give and take and other people can have a turn. So Let's... Let me let me just quickly say one more thing about the plenary. You know, yeah. we have a, um, a, 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 a. I'm just so happy that so many of us return again and again and again to Second Saturday. If if there are some new people here, um, I just want to assure people that we're we're a, a welcoming, kind, accepting group. So if there's somebody who's fairly new who hasn't spoken before at Second Saturday during plenary, don't. Don't be too shy. It's you. You are most welcome, and you know this is not a this is not a test. <laughs> you know this is this is just an opportunity for us to um, engage um, maybe uh, personally with this time. So uh, feel welcome. Yeah, thanks. Agreed. <laughs> uh, Naomi, Naomi Jacks, would you unmute yourself? Yes, Great. thank you. I just want to say uh, I'm so here. Thank you for calling attention to the spirit of the group, the, the talk about Lent. I do not know why, but I want to share with you. We live in a town, but on the edge, and we often see beautiful deer that are a nuisance. But the, the, the thing that came to me this morning is the scene of a mother quail and the teeny tiny little bobolink mm -hmm. quail following behind her changed me, softened oh. me. I I just w wanted to share that. I'm not sure why. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much for the challenge and the invitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
uh, Naomi, thank you. And and I think that what you've just described about paying attention to the quail, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the little one falling behind, that it it had an effect on you. I mean, and as you said, you know, it, something changed. I I think that's, uh, I put that in the category of the sacred. And I think that what you experience, that's what I'm getting at in talking about what is poesis, you know? And I think that next uh, next month, I might talk a little bit more about theopoetics, which is uh, basically what I'm, what, what I'm talking about here. Um, so I think you had an experience of theopoetics. Mm. Okay, but I don't want to put the Theo word in there, the God word there, because that may be a little uh, distracting for some of us, but it might be illuminating for others of us. Okay, but I think what you experienced was what I'm getting at. And I think that it's there at before us all the time. And and I think that's part of the wonder of existence. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you, um, Naomi, for sharing that. I think that's it's it's just it's just right. Mm. Yeah. Um, Robin Russell. Robin, can you unmute yourself? Good morning. Um, did I unmute myself? Yes, you, you did. did. You okay. Did. Um, I thought it was for me serendipitous that you brought up Ben Giat. Because what's been weighing really heavily on me lately is the direction the country's going in. I live in a conservative community. I hear a lot of hateful things. In the name of Jesus, churches are training people to go do anti-gay, anti-women's health activism in our legislature. And I keep thinking about Bonhoeffer and that just observing it isn't enough and that to not take action is to take action, but darn, I don't know what action to take. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Ruth, um, or Robin rather. Um, Ruth ben Giat has written a book called Strong Men. I've read it. Yeah, and it's a, it's, it's an important book. Um, and Bonhoeffer, uh, the Bonhoeffer dilemma, you know, he wasn't directly involved in the, um, attempt to assassinate Hitler, but he certainly was part of the resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think that very often fear makes us, uh, feel that we have nothing that we, there's nothing we can do. So I, I really appreciate what you're saying that, um, don't go back to sleep. But I think part of our challenge is how do we do this nonviolently? And um, maintain a, a, the, the express the depths of our human dignity, uh, not despair, not give up. But how do we do this? Okay. I think that's uh, an important thing for all of us to be thinking about together. Mm. So yeah. thank you, Ruth. But I keep, <laughs> how do I tell you? well, what is it about Ruth? Well, I should, you know, was... the biblical character Ruth. Anyway, thank you, Robin. <laughs> what a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, Jennifer Malewski. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Great. You can hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thinking about poesis and language, um, you know, I, I, I took a seminar once where we were, uh, challenged to inquire into what it would take to have a relationship with that whereof we cannot speak. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the divine is that realm. Right. It's that, it's that thing that's so true. It's beyond words. Uh, and in some ways, um, yeah, so, and you talk about the poesis being the experience itself, right? Like that, that the language of poetry isn't talking about something. Um, 
So there's a a, a Cherokee um, creation story where in the beginning there was nothing but water and all the animals are swimming in the water. And one after another, the animals dive under the water to try to see if there's something under the water. And I, it's such a powerful image. You talk about symbols, right? Like is that that diving down into the dark and cold where you can't breathe and you can't see just in the faith that there's got to be something there. And eventually one of the animals brings up some mud from the bottom and it spreads and spreads and spreads and makes all the land. Mm. And so to me, that's that's the poesis part. You talk about it's why we make our own meaning, you know, that we're reaching into that whereof we cannot speak. We're, you know, with our hand out diving and we uh and we come up with something that makes the ground on which we stand. Mm. So and I I'll say one more thing, which is I have a repeated conviction growing stronger that what God, if I had to distill down to one word, what God says, God says, and <laughs> God challenges a single conviction, nice. invites us to inquire further and to, you know, to break down our boundaries and invite in what we think can't be invited in and to not rest on our uh, ideas, but to continue to, like you say, deconstruct and say, and so thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, lovely, Jennifer. You um, you have spoken this so well and so wisely. Um, would you like to do our next session next month? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is it's very moving and enlightening and uh, affirming what what you've been describing. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah. So much. Yeah. How about Continue that? this this conversation, um, Jennifer, uh, wherever you are. Um, bring this bring your insights uh, to others. Hmm. Dennis, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I apologize. I came in about 20 minutes late this morning to join the group. So I hope Orwell hasn't been mentioned yet, has he? No, he has not. <laughs> in this topic, there's a very seminal essay by George Orwell, probably many of you know it, called uh, Politics and the English Language. Ah. In, in that essay, uh, one of his sayings, uh, definitions caught me, uh, has stayed with me a long time. Euphemism is language in the defense of the indefensible. Ah, I wow. think is the key to how authoritarian language destroys meaning. In contrast to that, uh, and I believe this quote comes from James Finley, the oh. mystic spiritual teacher. Yeah, he's uh, James Finley. He's terrific. I've gone, yeah, I've gone to many of his seminars. Um, I picked it up there, and I think it's original with him. In contrast to what Orwell said, he said, Poetic poetry is language in service of the unsayable. Yeah, I think that's well said. Thank you. Mm. And Jennifer was getting at that also, you know. I, yeah, poetry is language in service of the unsayable. Yeah. Mm. Nice. I'm and, just... And it was, isn't it a, a lovely little paradox that poetry is in the service of the unsayable? So that's where the sayable is in service to the unsayable, even though we know it's unsayable. Okay. Mm. Dennis, does that make sense? Oh, <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. Mm. The, and the unsayable. Ah, mm. ah, that is in, that in which we live and move and have our being. <laughs> Marianne, I just I, I want to share something from the the chat that just yeah. came up a little bit ago here. Um, and David Brock, if you are there and you want to unmute yourself, that would be great. David quotes um, Walter Brueggemann. And this is the quote. 
there are many pressures to quiet the text, to silence this deposit of dangerous speech, to halt this outrageous practice of speaking alternative possibility. The poems, however, refuse such silence. They will sound. Wow. Yeah. I love it. David, are you there? Yeah, he, did, he didn't I have his hand up, but he just put that in the yeah. chat. And anyway, I, just... I know, I don't, David. David, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to read that again for us, Jeff? Yeah. There are many pressures to quiet the text, to silence this deposit of dangerous speech, to halt this outrageous practice of speaking alternative possibility. The poems, however, refuse such silence. They will sound. Walter. Yeah. Walter Brueggemann yes. is, is a great guy. Fortunately, he's still around and still working and still writing. Um, and um, that, uh, that quote that you just shared reminds me of dangerous uh, speech, dangerous memory, which mm. is uh, also how um, sometimes we can think about Jesus. He's dangerous speech, and it's a dangerous memory. So yeah. uh, let us not forget. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I re yeah. I'm remembering uh a, David, a I quote. can your voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I'm I'm remembering a quote from uh, uh Lyndon Johnson, who uh had poets and musicians come to the White House, and it was during the Vietnam War, and the poets uh expressed their truth. And at the end, uh, Johnson is said to have said, uh, have uh, offered, uh, don't send me any more poets. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's dangerous speech, and Brueggemann's the best to remind us of that, other than other poets. But anyway, yes. thank you Agreed. for letting me share. Oh, yeah. Thank you, David, very much. Yeah. And indeed, Walter Brueggemann is a prophet in his own right. Yeah, yeah. Um, how about uh, Kate Gibbs? Kate, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, good morning, Kate. Good or good morning. Afternoon, where, no, you're in Canada. You're probably still morning. Yeah, you? yeah. yeah still late morning. Um, I just want to say thank you for mentioning, you know, the power of language because we <clears throat> I think we've forgotten that you know with um people we've gotten to a time where people can say things and they say that you know <clears throat> people are too sensitive or I'm allowed to express my opinion and that's true but it can have you know <clears throat> the saying sticks and stones can break your bones for work I, and I think that we've got to erase that I agree completely mm. yes yeah, sticks and stones may break your bones but names will never hurt you not true I yeah it's not hard true. because you know with people like Eckhart Tolle you you learn to like um try and be mindful and, and um, forget about whatever rambling on conversations in your mind, but it's really hard to forget. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that, Kate. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. It's those kinds of wounding words are very hard to forget. In fact, I've spent most of my life dealing with some of those. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. I'm 73. So I've been working with this for a long time. <laughs> and I'm not quite free yet. <laughs> anyway. Well, that's helpful for me. I'm 29. Um, <laughs> I didn't help. It doesn't help that I'm the youngest person on this. Well, yeah. Anyway, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, we, we, we need you. We need you. Yeah. That's part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're our future. So thank you. I'm glad you're here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, Marlene Krupp. Marlene, it's so nice to see you, I have to say. <laughs> Marlene is a friend of mine from a long time ago, Marianne. Oh, fabulous. Great. Um, we've been enjoying these second Saturday uh, conversations for quite a while now, and it's good to see you, Jeff, as well. I accidentally put my hand up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wasn't intending to make a response, but but thank you anyway. You don't want to take the floor for just a minute. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, well, at least it got you and Jeff to see each other face to face. Yeah, so that's, that's perfect. right. That's glad exactly. You're here. exactly. <laughs> you know you're here. <laughs> um, how about Linda Ashton? Thank you for all that has been said today. Uh, the list of things that you have triggered uh, of of is is I can't do it in two minutes. Uh, and I have absolutely no problem sharing my experiences, but I absolutely love the, the line that that uh, Johnson said, don't bring me any more poets. That's kind of the, the, the sense I get sometimes when I share, you know, something that's, that's really vital to me. Um, but I will share one experience. My brother was killed in Vietnam and I, it took me decades really to even try to or be able to have any kind of recovery from that. And we, we belong to a Oklahoma um, Broadway um, group. And so, you know, Broadway shows come through and Miss Saigon was on our list. Um, and I usually I listen to the music. I couldn't listen to the music that day. And but you know, when anyway, and I was telling everybody around me, my brother was killed in Vietnam, I may cry, you know, just be prepared. Um, and before the the uh uh production began, I remembered a Quaker saying, a friend, let me hold your burden. And so I got on Facebook and ask my friends, can you hold my burden? Please hold my burden uh, for the next couple of hours. Uh, when I walked out into the parking lot, I didn't need to pick it up. That burden was gone. Uh, I mean, and so, you know, to share that with others, yeah, right, Linda, yeah, right, yeah, right. Well, I know it's right. <laughs> I mean, the, to have the language to explain it, I don't know that there is when when there's resistance. You know, I'm looking for reception and um, instead there's resistance. But that doesn't keep me from sharing because there might be a spark in someone else that might free them to to really acknowledge their own experiences, uh, but to begin to recognize them and share them and share them. It's valuable. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you so much. And it was mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. I mean, so it's real. real. Oh. Nobody could talk you out of it. No. Oh, my God. Overwhelming. Absolutely overwhelming. Oh, wow. And I love what you're saying. And you knew it in your body. You felt oh, no it. Question. You knew it. So, I wasn't expecting it. I was not expecting it. Uh, I was expecting to, okay, now it's mine again. No, it's not. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's, yeah. And I think that that, I wasn't expecting it, but then I experienced it. I think that is also, you know, I, I use the word event today. Jack Caputo uses that word a lot. I think that we can appropriate it in many ways, but I think that what you experienced, that is the nature of event. It's something that comes that you don't know it's coming. Hmm. Yeah. You know? And it could be for good or not good. But in this case, this was this was liberating. This was healing. This was this you know, it, it you responded. Yeah. And 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 your request evoked a response. Yeah. And in a way you met in the air like those osprey, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Thank and you. This is, real. This is this is this is the gift of life. Mm -hmm. This is the gift of our being. And, you know, any time of year, we should 
try to remind ourselves and each other of this, but certainly in the season of Lent, it's like, don't say worm that I am. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I have the gift of being. Mm -hmm. And you've experienced it. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Linda. Uh, Lynn Tolk. Lynn. Thank you. First, uh, I want to thank you, Marianne, for giving me this reason to follow Jesus, mm. which is a thing I have struggled with a lot in my life. And what I heard was, I don't follow him to for because he forgave my sins, but because he invites me to what's possible. Yes. Mm. And that, that just <laughs> landed. Um, so sort of in celebration of that, I would like to write, I mean, I would like to read a poem that I wrote a few years ago. There is an artist, Frederick Frank, he's a painter and a sculptor, a uh, beautiful work that's very spiritual. And someone asked him if he believed in God. <laughs> His reply was that there is nowhere God is not. So the poem is a response to that quote to that statement. Lifetimes of meditation in one line from an eye that so obviously sees to be just that is our most creative work. And when my mind fails, falters in confusion, inadequate to such a calling, all is accepted, forgiven. Turns out I am my only critic, which is itself my greatest sin. To know this, however briefly, is to enter those realms I am told do not exist. I could live without such worldly wisdom. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Ben. And, uh, I can't help but think when you said, you know, oh, I've been told those worlds don't exist. <laughs> Jack Caputo might say they insist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They might not exist, but they insist. I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing the poesis. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Lynn. How about uh, Alexis? You're you're not you need to unmute yourself, Alexis. There you go. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um I really resonated with uh, Mary Ann's comments on Lent. I grew up in a traditional, a fundamentalist tradition, and until I was about 40, it was all about substitutionary atonement. At that point, I discovered Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan and uh, began to see things differently. You saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to me in all of my reading, and I have been reading um, uh, Saving Paradise yes, by, um, by Rita Block and Rebecca Parker, as well as a book called great. Why the, the Bible Was Written. Uh, and it seems to me that the institutional church has a vested interest in the substitutionary atonement approach or path. And I wonder if you think that might ever change. Yes. And uh, substitutionary atonement, I mean, atonement is fine and good, but substitutionary atonement, which was the brainchild of Anselm, I mean, it's brilliant, wrong in my opinion, and in the opinion of many, it didn't come around until around 1054. So halfway through, and you know this, halfway through our Christian history is when substitutionary atonement came in, okay? So talking about thought then, telling us what the experience of Jesus was in retrospect, that's, I, I, I think that's a, a misleading because, and some had thought about this, but I don't think it really had, was was really reflective of what Jesus' life and ministry was about. Right. Interestingly enough, 
it, there was a, you know, I, I don't know my church history all that well, but the Eastern church and the Western church were divided at the time of Anselm. The Eastern church never bought into substitutionary atonement. Okay. So um, even though it's the default mode for a lot of conventional, even classical theological Christianity, um, I think that um, it is uh, on the, uh, I think it's overdue for uh, deconstruction, which as you know, is not a negative thing. Deconstruction doesn't mean smash the state. It just means let's unpack this, open this, open this. And what is, what's behind this? What's behind this? Where did you get this? To get to the heart of the matter, if you will, and to see if there is a heart of the matter. I think that substitutionary atonement does not need to be an accepted doc doctrinal given in Christianity. Mm -hmm. In fact, if we don't re uh, uh, release that and um, re um, examine it and, and re articulate what Jesus' life and death was about, I think that's going to go down with the ship. One would hope. Um, I think that also, if you said my my personal say, saying is, I try to be a follower of the teachings of Rabbi Jesus, and as opposed to the substitutionary atoning death and and so forth. But it's um, <clears throat> and so belonging to the West Star Academy and belonging here to Second Saturday is really helpful. Also, seems to me that um, following the teachings of Jesus cannot be monetized by the church, mm -hmm. whereas um, being forgiven and, you know, doing this and doing that and buying your way out. Right. You know, Indulgences and all of that. Yeah, that's, that's you know, it's that's transactional. And I don't think Christianity it's transactional. is, it's is absolutely transactional. transactional. Yeah. And Jesus was never transactional. Jesus never said, if you want to eat with me and the guys show me your ID. Yeah. Um, you know, said everybody's invited to the party. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think Christianity has more to do with the quote unconditional, whatever that mm -hmm. is. Yeah, that's a whole nother right. thing. But then it's not a transactional uh quid pro quo. You believe this and then you'll get this as your yep. 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 Thanks, thank you. It, Christianity is actually a counter narrative to that, in my opinion. Yeah. It's a counter narrative to transaction, but mm -hmm. but it's succumb to conventional transactional thinking. Where there's money to be made. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> an accountant, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so you know whereof you speak there. <laughs> uh, 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 thanks. <laughs> right, uh, Marianne Mead, Marianne. Great. Um, I just want to ask you a detail, Marianne. Um, when you talk about, you talk about uh, poesis, poesis, and yes. you talk Poetics. Yes. Where is the link? Because um, po uh, theopoetics, I understand, is a, a sort of study of how um, we can make sense of the texts. I would but, say that's theology. Theology, okay. Because that's how do you make sense of the text? I mean, yeah. that's part of it. Logos, thinking, all that. Yeah. yeah. Poiesis, which is spelled completely differently, P O. Right. I E S I S. Um, I come from a sort of medical background, and poiesis to me I, makes me think of erythropoiesis, which is the formation of red blood cells. So, oh my goodness! Wow. Yeah, erythropoiesis. So you've got some diseases like sickle cell or whatever, where you have uh, a problem with the formation of red blood cells, and so people get pretty anemic. Now I ask myself, that is not what you mean. I think it is not what you mean, but it is formation. It is making formation of red blood cells, for example. So okay. I ask myself, where is the link between the two? Between poetics and, and poetics. Okay. Um, by the way, I just want to, I, I love what you're saying that poesis is also related in, in the medical or scientific world yeah. to producing red blood cells. Erythropoiesis, erythro, red blood cells, poiesis, manufacture of. I love it, because red blood cells, we need it to live. We yeah. do. So I love the fact that the word poiesis, to make, 
you know, yeah. create whatever is related to um, making our red blood cells. It's like, yes, if this is about life, it's about yeah. what gives us more life. Right. But I mean, I think all cells of the body somehow must have go, must go through some kind of poiesis because they need to be replaced, except our brains, actually. We don't usually yeah. replace them. And I love that, too. This stuff needs to be replaced. This is an open system. Yeah. yeah. So open. where do you see the link? The poiesis, I think, is the root word for that where we get the word poetics. I'm not sure. It's not? Okay. I think poetics is probably Latin, whereas poiesis is Greek. Ah, good. Okay. Well, you yeah. could help me with this. This, 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 this is worth uh, uh, unpacking then a little bit. Yeah. So, um, so you know more about this than I do. If the Latin and the Greek, what, what do you see as the well, difference? Well, I, I, I think the root of the words are different. So etymologically, I think uh -huh. they mean different things, and that's why I keep, I kept asking myself. Where do you see the link? And I'm not okay. sure that there is a link. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, in my, it's in my lack of, of knowledge here because I I assume that poesis was the root for poetics. No, it's P O I E S I S. That's correct. Poiesis. Yeah, that's Whereas, correct. The spelling yeah. is different. That's correct. That yeah. much I know. Yeah. Um, well, as I might say, let me get back to you on that. Okay. <laughs> Even better, have you get back to me on that. So let me just make a note, because yes, the poesis is P-O-I-E-S-I-S, -I -S, and mm -hmm. then poetics, it's, you know, P-O-E-T-I-C-S. Yeah. But um, I made an assumption. And so let me let me look into that. And it's yeah. maybe the difference between... I mean, it's just a detail, but I kept, I thought, kept thinking, yeah. what does yes, well, it this is, this is probably uh, not helpful at all. This is probably not good pedagogy. But intuitively, do you think that poetics has something to do with how I'm describing poesis? Um, doesn't really make that much sense to me, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't make plenty of sense to you, you know? <laughs> that, that's, yeah, no, that's linguistic hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. But I'll do that because the distinction might be actually important and clarifying for us. Yeah. And, and, yes, and it's right, I kind of mush them together. Yes. That and I think, I think it's yeah. different. I think when Caputo talks about theopoetics and when you talk about theopoetics, I think it's very much about the interpretation of the text to make God, to make God known. That's, that's what I looked at. But poiesis, I think, is completely different. It's more like um, uh, a physiological process. So it's not ah. linked to language. Uh, of course, it's a word, but it's not linked to language and interpretation of text. Oh, it's more interpretation of physiology. Ah, um, mm. yeah. ah. and see, I, I would with, with what I do and don't know, but I would say that poesis precedes interpretation. Please. Which one, the poesis or poes? Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm kind of putting them together, but I would say that, uh, that, that theopoesis is not just interpretation in a in a fixed way. It yeah. is more about um, what's happening in what's happening. Yeah. More than what it is. I mean that that does that's not helpful. I'm not a theologian, but Wikipedia, you know, thank goodness. Uh, it says it's the study and practice of making God known through text. Now, that okay. makes sense. Um, Does it? But but isn't that an interesting comment? This just say that again. I know I'm lingering on this, but say it one uh, more time. Uh, the term would be the study. That's theopoetics. The study and practice of making God known through text. Okay, and making God known through text. Okay, I would say that is not poesis. No, it's God. Here we here we're moving around with the unsayable and the sayable. Um, I think God is unsayable. That doesn't mean that we don't continue to try to say what we mean by God. Right. Well, that's theopoetics, but not poesis. Okay. I, I, 
think that yeah. that's it. Well, let me let me you know stay no. tuned. Come next time, and yes. I'm going to make a little note on this and see if the distinctions are actually you know helpful for our uh, okay. uh, understanding of this and our ability okay. to communicate this and what's important. Okay. Anyway, Marianne, I always appreciate you. Thank you. You're above my pay grade here, so. Uh -huh. no, 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 not at all. I just wanted to see what you saw as the link because I couldn't see it. Yeah. But, you know. And for me, you're right. I, rightly or wrongly, I, I, I linked them. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. You're right. Okay. <laughs> Etymology yeah. and grammar. Uh, yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Thank and you. and I know that we're getting close to um, out of time here, and I oh. think that maybe we can just, we can call on uh, Jim Hyde before we, and, but the etymology of this, I'll, I'll look at this. And there are folks who, who may be part of our group who know this stuff, Marianne, and if we had well, a little I, more time. I, I can it. tell you the chat is exploding with all <laughs> kinds of things from the OED and Wikipedia. And so Marianne, you've touched a nerve here. Good. <laughs> Good, 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 good. And, you know, I'm not the final authority here. It's very that's that that's an agreement we all have. I'm not the final. <laughs> I'm a prompter. I'm a I'm a I provoke. I don't I I prompt. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And and Jeff, it would be great if you could make a copy of the uh, uh, chat for me if you possibly can. We're at closing time, but Jim Hyde, do you have something uh, quickly to say before I do a close? I wanted to say good morning. Well, then, and, good morning to you. And I wanted to say that I hope everybody on this Zoom meeting was impressed as I was with Joe Biden's speech the other night. It was just wonderful. And it was very emotional to me because we are really facing bad times in our country. Mm -hmm. And when it was over, I thought, what can I post on Facebook that would say what I feel about what I've just seen? without creating more problems. And it just popped into my head and I posted, the truth will take you wherever you want to go. Telling lies will get you nowhere. Thanks, Joe Biden. Hmm. And I think that summed it up. It may even be poetic, I don't know. <laughs> Great. As you know, I don't do Facebook, so I'm so happy, Jim, that you included me in on your Facebook showing. Yeah just now. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my. Um, okay. Uh, next time, I'll continue to sort of fuss around a little bit more with uh, poetics and dogmatics and probably move a little bit into theopoetics, so, um, which is a hard thing to describe. But uh, that said, closing slides. Um, we'll have, uh, we'll post um, Seamus Haney's um, poem, Skylight, and I'm also going to uh, post a quote, and I'll, I'll send the quotes out to everybody uh, in another couple of weeks, uh, the, the, the quotes that were shown in the beginning of our, before our program started. But I'm going to um, uh, send out a quote by, uh, from Mark Oakley from a book called The Splash of Words, uh, Believing in Poetry. Somebody recommended this book, somebody from Second Saturday recommended this book to me quite a long time ago. It is wonderful. The Splash of Words, Believing in Poetry. And... Um, it's worth it for you to spend time to read the quote as one of our closing slides here. Uh, and this is the first sentence of, of the uh, second sl of the slide that I'll post. You might say that truth is far too important to be literalistic with. Truth, you might say that truth is far too important to be literalistic with, okay? That's the first line of a quote from Mark Oakley that'll be one of our closing slides. And I might say that when religion becomes literalistic, that's when the trouble starts. Okay. Um, closing music. I'm going to say something very briefly about that, and then we will move into, uh, we'll have, uh, in five minutes, we'll have um, it's coffee time for those who can stay. Um, the closing music that I've chosen for today is Rachmaninoff's Vocalese. He, he wrote it in 1915. And Vocalese is a melody without words. It's, um, if you will, it's felt, quote unquote, language. It's singing without um, text. Um, it's vocal sounds, um, syllables, um, vowel sounds without text. So, um, and, and I'm having, um, 
the the soprano who's singing this i think is just is exquisite um it's dame is it kiri t kanoa is that did i pronounce that properly okay she is exquisite and she does the rachmaninoff um vocalese i think exquisitely and um it's 5 minutes and 21 seconds so it's 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 slightly long uh closing music but it's worth in my opinion it's worth listening to and I chose it in part because I'm sort of struggling with an analogy. I think that vocalese is to music what poetics might be to language. I mean, I'm just making this up. But a vocalese expresses something, and you will experience her vocalese as though she is, as though it is a, a kind of narrative that it'll move you, it'll evoke stuff in you, it, it expresses something deep, it'll, you will receive it at a deep level, I'm, I'm sure. And, and, it, and the, vo the vocalese without a text, but it takes us somewhere. And, and I suggest that poetics does the same thing in language. It takes us somewhere without explaining it, okay? So, um, Anyway, enjoy uh, Rachmaninoff's vocalese, and um, I, for those who can come to coffee time, we'll meet in another five minutes and 21 seconds, and I will look forward to seeing others of you for our next second Saturday, which is April 13th. So thank you so much for um, being uh, with, with us today, and for all of your um, really, um, insightful and provocative contributions to our conversation today about poetics and dogmatics. Okay. See you next time.